And uh, you're exactly the kind of preacher we love to hear. Amen. <laughs> And turn with me to the book of Luke in chapter number 12. The book of Luke tonight, chapter number 12, and I'd like to begin reading in verse number 13. <clears throat> Luke chapter 12 and verse number 13. And what a wonderful night again to be with God's people. My wife and I would certainly like to say, <laughs> excuse me, that's not what we wanted to say. <clears throat> What we wanted to say was thank you so much for your graciousness and your kindness and, and the hospitality, how we love your pastor and Mrs. Lawson, and, and we're so grateful for them and their faithful testimony for Christ, and and I'm um, thankful that God's led him and brought him to this place. Thank you, preacher. Amen. And we're grateful for their work for you, and thankful to the Lord for your faithfulness to Jesus as well. And I, I want to encourage you just to keep on abounding in the work of Christ. Your labor's not in vain in him. I, I love that because that verse is in the present tense. You know, we usually read that verse, and then we break out into it will be worth it all. Well, of course it will, but that's not what the verse is saying. It's going to be worth it when we see Christ. Well, certainly but it's worth it right now, right now to live for him. And right now, our work for Jesus is not in vain. Let me just encourage you to say, by the grace of God, we're going to step out by faith and, and attempt mighty works for our king. And, and God bless you as you labor for him. This whole city, our whole state of Arizona is lost in desperate need of the gospel. And I encourage you just to join Brother Lawson and say we're going to step out and trust God to do a great work for him. God bless you as you labor for the Lord. You have your Bible tonight to the book of Luke in chapter number 12. The book of Luke in chapter number 12. And, and the Bible's about ready to tell us a story that, that Jesus can't seem to shake loose from. You know, sometimes, and we make a big mistake when we do this, we, we come and maybe pull a story right out of the Bible that's called taking it out of context, and we don't let the Lord Jesus set it up like the Bible wants him to. Well, we come to Luke chapter 12, and it really is a powerful, powerful chapter. We're about ready to read the story of, of a man that's got a request for the Lord Jesus Christ. But to appreciate what's happening here, you have to go back in Luke chapter 12 and listen as the Lord Jesus Christ is preaching. Now, he is slowly but surely making his way towards Jerusalem, where he ultimately will die on the cross for you and for me. And now the Lord Jesus along the way is a great crowd the people that have come. And as you study the book of Luke, it's important, it's incredibly important to notice to whom Jesus is preaching. There is either first the multitude, the crowds that were there, and, and I kind of noticed the multitudes come for free meals and free miracles and, and free messages. But you know, when the meals and the miracles and the messages stopped, the crowds stopped as well. Sometimes Jesus is dealing with the multitude. There are many times where, of course, Jesus is dealing with his disciples and he is training them and principle after principle, he's laying them down one by one. He knows by the end of the book of Luke, he'll be on a cross, he'll come from the empty tomb and soon will ascend into heaven and his disciples have a job to do. They are on a crash course for a few years and, and there's no seminary or Bible college that ever did it like this. The disciples have lessons to learn. They have Christian character that needs to be built in their life. And throughout the book of Luke, Jesus is either teaching to the multitudes, he is building his disciples, or the third possibility, and it probably is the more frequent one, Jesus is dealing with the Pharisees. I call the Pharisees the religious establishment. You know, that word establishment kind of says it all, doesn't it? You hear the word establishment, we kind of think of people in Washington, D.C., or, or maybe in our state, we think of people on Washington Street. And when we say the word establishment, you know, it's kind of like, well, they've been there a little too long. They think they're a little more important than they really are. They, they think they're smarter than they really are, and, and they've taken more authority upon themselves than they really should. You know, that word establishment kind of says it all in one word. Well, the religious establishment was exactly the same thing. They were the ones that were scholars and experts. They were professionals in this thing of religion. And the religious establishment, a.k.a. the Pharisees, and I think you could lump the Sadducees in there as well, but these were the ones who thought they knew it all. They were telling everybody else how to run their life. And, and if you wanted to go to heaven, well, to them, the 
path to heaven led through the teaching of these Pharisees, the religious establishment. And as you read the book of Luke, it is incredible how often Jesus is going after them. He does so earlier in this chapter where he stands up in front of the people and he says, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. I got to tell you right away, there's preaching you'll never hear in America. The Lord Jesus looks at the crowd in front of him and there were big crowds sometimes and he points to the religious leadership that follows him everywhere he goes. You know, one thing about Jesus, he didn't talk behind any anybody's back. No, the Lord never stabbed anybody in the back. He might have stabbed some people in the stomach, but they certainly saw it coming. And I'll promise you, standing in front of the multitude, on the side are the religious doctors, the religious scholars, the religious seminary professors, and they absolutely despise Jesus Christ. And Jesus points at him and he tells the people, beware of the leaven, the phoniness of the, of the Pharisees. They're hypocrites. If that weren't enough, Jesus turns around and looks at the unsaved people that were in front of him. And in verse number five, he said, I will forewarn you whom ye shall fear. Fear him which after he hath killed, hath power to cast into hell. Yea, I say unto you, fear him. Now the Lord Jesus starts out by preaching against the hypocrisy of religion. Then the Lord Jesus starts to go where you're not supposed to go anymore. He starts preaching on that subject that you're not supposed to preach about. He starts preaching about hell. My friend, the Lord Jesus stands up and said, as much as you'll be afraid of somebody who holds a weapon and they can take your life, you better fear the one that can cast you into hell. There are people who look at that verse and make a big error. They think Jesus is telling us to fear Satan. However, Satan never has and he never will, nor does he have the authority to cast anyone into hell. The one who sends people to hell is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. And he tells the people in front of him, you'd better be afraid about this place called hell. I mean, in one message now, you get to verse number 11, and he tells his disciples, when they bring you into the synagogues, under the magistrates and powers, take ye no thought how or what thing ye shall answer or what ye shall say. For the Holy Ghost shall teach you in the same hour what you ought to say. I mean, we haven't gotten 11 verses, and Jesus has told the, the basically the religious establishment off. Then Jesus has done the unthinkable. He has warned people to flee from hell and get saved. Now he he looks at his disciples and says, and oh, by the way, gentlemen, one day you are going to suffer great things for God. You're going to be thrown in jail. You're going to be persecuted. You're going to pay a price for me. And I got to tell you right about now in Luke chapter number 12, things probably were, and if they weren't, they should have been extremely quiet. You know, sometimes people say, well, don't you like it when everybody's shouting, amen, amen. Well, that's okay. But you know what I like better? I like it when it gets really quiet. When you know the Lord is doing something powerful. And when Jesus starts preaching against religious hypocrisy and he starts preaching about hell and he starts preaching about persecution, it pretty much covers everybody in the building. And by now, everybody should have been awfully quiet until you come to verse number 13 and, and you can almost picture it. There's this mass of people and somebody's waving their hand in the air because they have something really important to say. You know, I got to tell you right about now, if I were in that crowd, I hope hope I'd be smart enough not to say anything, but not this guy. Oh, no. No, he's got something really, really important to say. It's got to be more important than religious phoniness. It's got to be more important than heaven and hell. It's going to have to be more important than dying for Christ. No, no, no. This is really, really, really important. Have you ever asked yourself... If you had one question that you could ask Jesus, what would you ask him? Have you ever wondered, I mean, you get one chance now to raise your hand in the crowd. You're going to ask Jesus a question, so what's that question going to be? Would you notice what this man says in verse number 13? And one of the company spake unto him, said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Really, this is what you come up with? With the Lord Jesus warning people about hell? With Jesus Christ condemning the religious hypocrisy? With the Lord Jesus pretty much telling his disciples, you are going to suffer, and oh, by the way, I'll tell you next week, you're going to die for me. In the middle of all this, here's this guy raising his hand saying, I got something more important in heaven and hell. I got 
want something more important than discipleship. Lord, this is the biggest thing here today, and I need you to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Really? You know, it's pretty hard to ask such a dumb question, but the guy managed to do it. And not only does he ask an incredibly dumb question, well, this guy's going to pay a tremendous price. Because while we read a verse or two and kind of forget it, the rest of the chapter hinges on what this guy has done. He's standing up here in the crowd saying, Jesus, and, and isn't, it, isn't it nice? He, he not only has a question for Jesus, but he also has the answer to the question for Jesus. You know, he says, Jesus, I'll cut you out of the problem. You're not going to have to do any legwork. So I have a problem, and what you need to do is tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know, the Lord wouldn't get over this for a long time. I mean, he's about ready to tell a disciple a, a story where he's pretty much point, pointing his finger at that guy and telling the people, don't be like him. Then he's going to turn around and preach to his disciples and say, don't be like that guy. Because if you are, you're going to spend your life in fretting and worrying and fear. And then he's basically going to say, don't be like that guy. Because if you're like him, you're not going to be watching and waiting for the Lord Jesus Christ to come. It is very rare that you get a whole chapter where Jesus is hammering one guy. You know, it takes a lot. And I mean, it takes a lot to exhaust the patience of the Lord Jesus Christ. This guy managed to do it with his dumb question. Jesus, I got something more important in heaven and hell. Jesus, I need you to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Well, in verse number 14, he, that's Jesus, said unto him, and look at this next word, man. You know, that doesn't really impress us in America because we kind of use that word. We, we, we get that. You don't talk like this in the Middle East now, but especially not 2,000 years ago. Not long ago, I was in the country of Jordan, you know, and, and every place I went, you walk into a store, you walk into a restaurant, oh, friend, friend, friend. You know what it's like over there? Oh, friend, friend, friend. <laughs> Who are you? What's your name again? Oh, you're the best friend the guy ever had, or more, more accurate, your wallet is the best friend the guy ever had. But, you know, that's how they talk to perfect strangers. Everybody's a friend. I mean, when Judas is ready to betray the Lord Jesus, he says, friend, betray us thou me with a kiss. Everybody's a friend. But when Jesus said to him in verse number 14, man, I promise you the word is a very harsh word. The Lord is doing something incredibly unusual. The Lord Jesus has really given it back to this guy. Now, here is nothing friendly here. We have nothing in common here. He said, man, who made me a judge and a divider over you? Uh, and then in verse number 15, pointing at this guy, he looks at the crowd in front of him. He looks at the disciples beside him. And he says, take heed and beware of covetousness. For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things that he possesseth. Father, help us tonight as we go to the Bible. Speak to every man, lady, young person. I pray in Jesus' name. The Lord has a way of doing that, doesn't he? he? You know, this guy thinks, you know, my biggest problem in life is my brother. My biggest issue is the inheritance. And you need to tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. He's ripping me off. He's stealing from me. He thinks his big problem is his brother. He thinks his big problem is an inheritance. Do you know what his big problem is? Right there. Take heed and beware of covetousness. Covetousness is a huge thing in the Bible. Covetousness, you know, we kind of get the idea, and this is certainly part of it. Covetousness says, I need to have more stuff, more for me, more money, more toys, more things. I need more for me. But, you know, that's only half the story of covetousness. Because covetousness in the Bible not only says, I need more for me, but it also says, I need more than you. It, it, it is not just greed. It is a combination of greed and pride. It, it's why when God gave us 10 commandments, actually gave us 613, who's counting, one of them said, thou shalt not covet, because covetousness goes beyond greed. It's not just saying, I need more money, I need more stuff, I need more mammon, I need more toys, but it is also saying, I need to be bigger than you. I need to be better than you. I need more for me, and what's going to make me happy is that I get more than you have. It certainly is a vicious and a wicked and an angry sin. 
And that's why the Lord does what he does so perfectly. And of course he can. Because while you and I look on the outward appearance, the Lord looks on the heart. And you know, this guy could have sounded really spiritual. You know, my brother, we got to all pray for him now, Brother Lawson. And we got to pray that the Lord would get a hold of his heart because he needs to divide the inheritance. I can just imagine what it would have sounded like, you know, in an emergency email prayer request going around. But the Lord Jesus knew exactly what to problem. The problem is not your brother. The problem is not the inheritance. The problem is not the will. The problem is your dirty heart and your covetousness. And he looks to the crowd in front of him and he will spend the rest of the chapter pointing at this guy and saying, don't be like him. I got to tell you, that's a stunning thing. You know, I could tell you, well, you don't need me to tell you. My wife's here. She could tell you. I've done a lot of dumb things, just a lot of dumb things. I'm just going to go out on a limb and guess Mrs. Lawson could tell us that her husband has done one or two dumb things. And if she wouldn't, her, the sis would do it for sure. No doubt about that. that. She'll take care of it. Every good sister knows how to do that. But can I give you the good news tonight? The good news is that for all the dumb things that I have done and maybe Pastor Lawson has or hasn't done, the good news is none of those dumb things are written in the Bible. You know why that's good news? Because when the trumpet sounds and we're out of here, nobody's going to remember anymore. <laughs> They're all gone. But the problem with Luke chapter 12 is this man is going to raise his hand and say a statement that is so incredibly and colossally dumb that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to point this out for the rest of the chapter and for all of eternity when we are in heaven and the Lord Jesus says, open your Bible to Luke chapter 12 forever and forever and forever with the eternal words of God settled in heaven. We're never going to forget how foolish this man really is. Take heed and beware of covetousness. So in verse number 16, he spake a parable unto them, saying the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. The Lord Jesus is ready to tell a story. And he said, you need to understand in the story, there's a man who has ground. Notice it doesn't say he has a ranch. It doesn't say he owns a farm. The Bible tells us he owns ground. He owns territory. So we are not looking at a farmer here. We are not looking at a rancher here. We are looking at an incredibly wealthy businessman. The man owns lots. The man owns territory. As far as the eye can see, the Bible doesn't say his farm brought forth plentifully. The Bible says his territory, his ground. It was a great year. It was an exceptional year. The man is already a wealthy man, and now he is a wealthier man. So there's a great surplus because his vast holdings have multiplied themselves, and Mr. Businessman has to figure out what he is going to do. So in verse number 17... He thought within himself, saying, What shall I do because I have no room where to bestow my fruits? This is going to be a problem. There are 12 times that I counted in the book of Luke where the Bible tells us that humans went to themselves to find out what to do. Like this man, they talked to themselves. They went to themselves. They went to their heart to find out what they were supposed to do. You know, that's always a tragic thing. Twelve times in the book of Luke, humans go to themselves as the authority to find out what to do. And every time they come up with the wrong answer. You know, we live in a day where people are taught you follow your dreams. You follow your heart. Your heart isn't going to lie to you. Oh, yes, it is. God said our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. The biggest liar that I will ever have to deal with is not going to be a lawyer. It's not going to be a politician. The biggest liar that I'll ever deal with lives right here. Our hearts are deceitful and desperately wicked. Nobody can know it. And now this man is going to go to his heart. He's going to go to his heart to find out what to do. The Bible tells us he went to himself and said, what shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. You know, in the Middle East, if a problem like this arose, and you'd have to say it's a good problem. I mean, man, you've had a bumper crop year. Your ground is produced immensely. In the Middle East, it would be the common thing for a family leader to get all the family together, get all the neighbors together, and get all the sages together. And, and you know, in the Middle East, and for a guy like me that's kind of in a hurry all the time, it, it's really frustrating, you know, because they'll sit around all day long and just talk, you know, and just ask questions that don't matter.
matter and on and on and on and on and everybody's got to stroke their beard, you know, and everybody's got to give their opinion. And if they just said it, it'd be fine, but it takes them a half an hour to say it, you know. And, and I got to tell you, but that's how they did it. And that's the normal thing. What are you going to do with your bumper crop? Well, you know, you may already know, but what you're supposed to do is go meet with the neighbors, go meet with the sages, go meet with the experts, go meet with everybody, have a big consensus and get them to agree with you and do what you were going to do anyhow. Not this guy. He's thinking to himself. And so in verse number 18, he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. This man is an incredibly smart businessman. You know, please understand as we make our way through the story, uh, you might know where it goes to. And I, I certainly do. And it goes to God looking at the guy saying, thou fool. But, you know, I want you to understand tonight that if you and I had met this guy, not a one of us would think he was a fool. If the man lived today, you know where you'd find him? You would find him on CNBC in the morning giving business advice. This man was brilliant. I mean, not only is he already incredibly wealthy, and not only has he figured out to have a hyperabundance on his massive holdings, but now he comes up with a business plan, and it's brilliant. He said, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull down my barns and build... I mean, that's brilliant. Because number one, if he says, and this is what I would do, you know, I got the bumper crop. Hey, let's take all the goods. Let's take all the fruit. Let's go to the market. Let's sell it. And let's go to Hawaii for vacation. But the problem is if you have excess crop and you bring it to the market, all you're going to do is take the price of beans and turn it south. And the guy knows that. So he said, instead of selling it all right now and taking a profit now, a small profit, I'm going to wait until there are no beans on the market, and then I'll raise the price. And so he said, what I'm going to do, I'm not going to sell it now. I'm going to put it in barns. But even that was brilliant because the man understands the value of the ground. He understands that ground is producing, that ground is producing. But if I put up a barn on that ground, the ground isn't going to produce. Instead, I'm going to have a barn, a storage barn. So he said, instead of building more barns, that's what I would have come up with. Oh, you need more storage? Build more barns. No, no. If I build more barns, then I'm going to take away ground that is making me rich. So do you see what he says? I'm going to build bigger barns and better barns, and this guy is brilliant. Do you understand? The man is just brilliant. The guy in this story understands business better than ever. Maybe that's why he didn't talk to anybody. He's the smartest guy in the room anyway. This guy knows how to get the ground to produce. This guy knows how to possess the ground. This guy knows how to have a business plan. Everything about this guy says superstar on CNBC. Everything about this guy says what a businessman. He is respected. He is honored. The man is absolutely brilliant. From what he owns to what he does to what he plans, this guy knows how to get it done. And would you notice the Bible tells us at the end of verse 18, he said, I'm going to bestow all my fruits. Well, we got that from the grounds, but he also is going to sit, put his goods in there. So the man's not just a farmer. He's not just a rancher. He doesn't just have ground that is producing fruits and crops. The man also, well, he's pretty much like Sam Walton, isn't he? He sells goods. So it's not just what you think. It's not just the ranch and the farm. No, this guy has got all kinds of things. Who knows when you walk into his brand of Walmart what you have. And now he's building bigger storehouses and better storehouses. So the ground keeps producing. Wherever he gets his crops from, wherever he gets his goods from, they are packed into those storage houses. I mean, the man is rich right now, and he's going to be richer tomorrow. Next month, he'll be richer than tomorrow. Next year, he'll be richer than next this year. This man is an incredibly successful businessman. I say that tonight because you and I are not in the habit of calling good business people fools. You know, in America, I mean, if somebody kind of looks like a businessman, they, they walk like a businessman, they act like a businessman, they get a lot of respect. They really do. I mean, they get a lot of honor. They're people that understand this thing. This guy right here is honored and beloved and respected. The man has it going for him. Everybody would look at him and say, that guy is a great success. So what are you going to do, Mr. Rich Man? Verse 19. After I build the barns, after I have a great year, after I get it all put away, I will say to my soul, this thing has just gotten worse, hasn't it? 
He started out by talking to himself, and when you talk to yourself, you always get the wrong answer. But this guy's going to take it up to a different level. He's not just talking to himself. Now he is talking to his soul. And that's a problem because when you talk to your body, your body might say, you know, I need a drink of water. Your body might say, I need something to eat. But when you start talking to your soul about heaven and hell and about eternity, you're on extremely dangerous ground. So he said to my soul, soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. He's not talking to his preacher. He's not talking to, he's not talking to God. He's not talking to anybody that can give him a real answer. So he talks to his soul. Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. This is what I'm going to do. After I get the business plan done, then I'm just going to take it easy. I'm going to take my vacation. I'm going to eat and I'm going to drink and I am going to be merry. It's interesting when you notice those verbs very carefully. When he said, take it easy, he said, it's going to be a permanent vacation. I am going to constantly be at ease. But he says, when I am going to be merry, there's a subtle difference here. He said, I am going to spend every day of my life taking it easy, but then I am going to let all the riches and all the wealth and all the pleasures and all the eating and all the drinking, those are the things that are going to make me merry I will eat drink and be merry by my eating and by my drinking I'll be a happy man and doesn't that describe Tucson Arizona doesn't that describe the man who's still working all week if they're working anymore for Friday night and when Friday night comes, I'm going to eat and I'm going to drink. And those things, those parties, those occasions, those pleasures, the eating and the drinking, the partying, the rest of it, that's what's going to cause me to be a merry man. That's what's going to cause me to have happiness in my life. So if I can take it easy and if I can take this vacation and if I can drink and if I can eat and if I can do all the things that I want to do, uh, then he said, I am going to become a merry man. Food and drink and money and pleasures are going to make me happy. And if that isn't the biggest lie that Satan started way back in the Garden of Eden, and he's still telling tonight, I'm not quite sure what is. What a fool. And yet you and I, if we could go back in time and insert ourselves into this story, we would be saying, what a guy. Look at that guy, how rich he is. I look at the ground. You can't even see how far it goes. I look at those massive barns. Nobody's built anything like that. You and I would look at this guy and we would call him an unqualified success. But the truth of the matter is his covetousness has made him a selfish man. It's made him a lonely man. And I'm afraid it's made him a foolish man. Do you see what God says in verse number 20? God said unto him, thou fool. No, no, we wouldn't call it a fool. We wouldn't think of him a fool. But a very rare thing is happening in the Bible. You know, there are plenty of verses in Psalms and especially Proverbs where the Bible says the person who says this, the man who does this, the young person who like this is a fool there are plenty of verses that say the fool has said in his heart there is no God there are a lot of Bible descriptions of the foolish man but there are very rare occasions where God points a finger at somebody and says thou fool brother there are people you've met that you've thought are fools and certainly I've got the same to say but when God says a man's a fool he's a fool indeed that word fool is an interesting word in our day, the word fool pretty much has one meaning. You know, there's a few fries missing in a Happy Meal. You're, you're, you're lacking here, buddy. There is no soft way to call somebody a fool. But you know, in New Testament times, the word fool could refer to someone who hadn't put it together, who hadn't added it up. In, in one sense, it wasn't too offensive. That's why on the road to Emmaus, the Lord Jesus could look at two disciples that loved him. They were probably willing to die for him. They honored him. They gave their lives to him. And Jesus said, oh, fool and slow of heart. That used to bother me. How come Jesus could call Cleopas and whoever else was there a fool? Because when he uses the word, he is not saying you're ignorant or you're stupid, but he is saying you're missing something. Let me help you with this. But the word fool can also mean you're a mess. And you can be sure that's exactly how God is using it here. Sir, you are stupid. 
And the Lord said, thou fool. And here's the reason. Because tonight, this night, thy soul shall be required of thee. So tonight, you're going to die. Now, you got a great building plan of what you're going to do with the ground, but it ain't going to matter. And you got all these plans how you're going to tear down the barns and build bigger ones and better ones. And you're going to take all the crops and all of your other goods that you sell, and instead of flooding the market and having a poor business plan, now you're going to store them, and you're going to wait for just the right time. And after you've done all these buildings, and after you've done all the selling, and after you've invested in your plan, then you think you're going to have all the time you want to sit back, take it easy, take your vacation and eat drink and you think you've got a day where you're going to be merry but God said no tonight thy soul shall be required of thee excuse me sir you're going to die Tonight you're going to die. So the question of Luke chapter 12, and it's not just the question for a dumb man who's waving his hand in the air saying, I got something more important to say here than you have. It is not just the story of one man. It is the story of disciples who live in fear. It is the story of the people of God that live in covetousness. It is the story of an unsaved man that would die and go to hell because stuff is more important than his soul. And Jesus said, tonight you're going to die then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? Do you catch the irony? The guy started out by waving his hand saying, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. You know what Jesus is doing? He's saying, you're so dumb you don't understand that one day your sons are going to come and ask the same question as some rabbi. When you die, whatever you leave, your boys are going to get in a fight and they're going to do the exact same thing you're doing with your brother right now. Son, what good is it going to be? What good is it if you get the barns? What good is it with all the grain? What good is it with all the goods? What good is it if you pack it to the ceiling? You're the wealthiest businessman in the world because tonight you're going to die. What good is it going to be? But you know, there's something incredibly alarming, isn't there? Because I, I say Jesus said tonight you're going to die, but that's not precisely what he said. And when you look at this verse, suddenly the word of God shows you and it shows me that God has a very different way of looking at death than you and I do. You see, we think, well, oh, somebody lives their life, you know, some you live a good life, some don't live such a good life. There are some people that are smart, some not so smart, some are successful, some not so successful, some are educated, some aren't. And we kind of judge people and look at people and we watch them live and then one day there's a funeral and they die and, and we think, well, you know, they lived and they died, but that's not what God said. God did not say, tonight you're going to die. Tonight your soul will be required. Boy, that word required would suddenly start the alarm bells for Mr. Businessman. It was a word that came right out of the business community. The word required was a word that a bank would use when they were requiring someone to pay a note. They were requiring someone to pay the bill. We have given you a loan. Now why are we calling the loan in? We are requiring payment on the loan. Do you see how God looks at your life and my life? Because most people tonight, and I mean people in churches, like Temple Baptist Church have an attitude that it is my life and I'm going to do what I want. And I'm going to go where I want. And I'm going to be what I want. It is my life. Life. You keep your hands off my life. You know what God says? He says tonight, your life and my life is alone from him. And it is not that one day you're going to die. One day God is going to say, I'm requiring payment on the loan. In other words, you and I are going to give an account to him. No, no, no. God is saying... And let's talk to the child of God for a minute at Temple Baptist Church. Saved, what does that mean? You've come as a sinner. You believed on the Lord Jesus Christ in repentance and faith. You've trusted Jesus. And now the Lord is coming especially to you and me tonight and said, excuse me, but I have made a great investment in you. I so love the world, I gave my only begotten son. I have purchased you with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. God has paid a great price for me. God has paid a great price for you. The cost for our souls is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. In other words, God is saying to every child of God in this room tonight, I have made a great investment in you, but you better understand that it is not one day the doctors are going to say they took their last breath, they heart beated for the... No, sir. One day, 
God says, I'm going to require you. It is not the day of death. It is the day when we are called in for this thing called our life. What are we going to say? For the child of God, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. I know the singers, and I know that a lot of ministers in modern houses of religion, and they're talking about how sweet and wonderful and great it's going to be, and the fried chicken and all the rest of it. Brother, there ain't going to be no fried chicken at the judgment seat of Christ. What there will be, however, is the terror of the Lord. And that's the day that you and I are going to call in to pay back our loan. God's invested a lot at Temple Baptist Church. And one day the requirement day is coming where he is expecting a return on his investment. And you and I are going to have to explain what we have or haven't done. If you're not saved, one day you're going to die. And it's not just that you're going to die, but it's going to be requirement day. Thy soul shall be required of thee. What good is it going to be if you're living for the today and you're not ready for eternity? What good is it going to be if you have everything the world can give, but you're not saved? What good is it tonight, as Jesus said, if you gained the whole world and you lost your own soul? And God says, tonight I gave my son to die on a cross. Is it nothing to you? Jesus shed his royal blood for your sins. Is it nothing? to you. Jesus paid the greatest price that heaven could pay so that a man, a woman, a boy or girl in this room or watching online could believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. But make no mistake about it. You can reject Jesus. Someone can walk out that door without him. Somebody can turn off the, the, the internet tonight and say, I don't want him. Somebody could mock him. Somebody could curse him. Somebody could deny him. But one day you're going to have to answer to God. And the wicked shall be turned into hell in all the nations that forget God. It is not just that we die. Our souls are required. Years ago, there lived a famous entertainer in America named Frank Sinatra. Frank Sinatra certainly was famous, famous for a lot of things. But I'm afraid that he was most famous for his fornication. Famous for his wives, four of them. Famous for his multiple affairs. Frank Sinatra was famous for his drinking. He was famous for his violence. And he was famous for his crime associations. Very few people in America have flaunted their wickedness and their sin like Frank Sinatra. But you know, of all the things that Frank Sinatra was famous for, maybe, maybe, he is most famous for a song that he sang. And it went like this. And now the end is near, and so I face the final curtain. My friend, I'll say it clear. I'll state my case, of which I'm certain. I lived a life that's full. I've traveled each and every highway. And much, much more, he sang, I did it my way. No one could argue that Frank Sinatra did it his way. His filth, his evil his corruption, his thievery, his fornication. Yes, he did. He did it his way. But on May the 14th, 1998, the man who did it his way died God's way. A few days later in Cathedral City, California, they buried him, and when they put him in a casket, in his hand was a bottle of Jack Daniels. As they buried Frank Sinatra, you'd have to say he did it his way. But he died on God's terms. No matter how rich, no matter how powerful, no matter how great, no matter how smart, every single human has an appointment with the judgment of God. Not a one of us here in God's eyes are going to die. Our souls will be required. And God points at a man and tells a crowd in front of him, you don't be like him. Don't let stuff take you to hell. Yeah. Father, I pray tonight that the word of God would do great works in our hearts and in our lives. And, 
And Lord, the somber, somber warning of Luke chapter 12, may it ring powerfully for every single one of us in this room tonight. I pray if someone here, maybe someone listening online, has never been saved, that you would help them understand there is a reason that God said now is the accepted time. That reason is because it could be tonight someone's soul is required of them. May tonight be the night they're saved. I pray for your people. I pray the word of God would break us out of our lethargy. And, and Lord, if we live for the world and we live for stuff and we live for the toys and the treasures, those things that are going to pass away, help us understand tonight what an empty life it is. One day our soul will be required. Lord, may it be certain tonight that we are not living for the things that are going to pass away. I wonder before I finish praying if somebody tonight would say, I'm the one who needs to be saved. If I, my soul were required tonight, I don't know that I'm going to heaven. I want Pastor Lawton to open the Bible and show me from God's word how Jesus can save me. I'd love to pray for you tonight. And, and then my friend Pastor Lawton would love to sit down with the Bible and show you how to be saved. Is there somebody tonight? That's me. Pray for me. I want to know from the Bible that Jesus is my Savior. Would you just lift your hand tonight? And I'd love to pray for you. And then, then we'd like to help you from the Bible because the answer is never get church or get religion. The answer is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Could there be somebody here tonight, maybe someone listening online, if you're not saved, I plead with you to send a contact note, a, a text, an email to Pastor Lawton. He wants to help you right from the Bible so you can know you're saved. Now tonight I'm going to pray. Then we're going to play in that invitation song. And if you're not saved, come and meet Pastor Lawton. Let him help you from the Bible. We'll open the scriptures and show you how to be saved. You know him as your Savior. These chairs here tonight, this altar's a great, great place to get on our knees and say, my priorities are wrong. Lord Jesus, I need to get things right between my soul and my Savior. Father, help us. Remind us that one day our souls will be required. Remind us that one day we will step out into eternity and only what we have done for Jesus Christ is going to matter. Help your people tonight for someone perhaps without Jesus what a night to be prepared to meet God. I ask for your help in the great name of Jesus, I pray.